Our special guest in this episode is a certified expert with more than 50 years of experience in the surety bond industry. In fact, his expertise has earned him the respect and trust of those in the surety and construction businesses as one of the foremost surety bond professionals in the country. In addition, he has been actively involved in the construction management program at FIU, Florida International University, for nearly 30 years, with eight of those years as an adjunct professor for the construction management school. My dear friends, please help me welcome Mr. Charles Nielsen, president of Nielsen Hoover Group Companies. Well, thank you very much for, for being here in Private Construction the Podcast. Um, I am very, very thrilled and very, very excited to have my friend, Chuck Nielsen, my first bonding a- agent, uh, really. I, I, maybe I had somebody else before, but you, you really have been the, what, a person that has been very impactful in our, in our company, in the growth of uh, our company, and you and I. So thank you for your friendship and thank you for the impact that you have had in the our industry. So can you please introduce yourself to our audience? My name is Charles Nielsen and uh, the company that uh, uh, I am associated with is called Nielsen Hoover and Company. We are the, for want of a better definition, the largest privately owned surety brokerage in the Southeast United States. Nielsen Hoover and Company does nothing but provide surety credit to the construction industry and associated industries that may need uh, surety credit. So, and we've been doing this for, uh, I have been doing it in Florida for the last 55 years. So we're grateful to be here and appreciate uh, the invitation from Patricia and appreciate the fact that, you know, she's taking the time and making the effort to uh, dispense the knowledge and information that she has to her guests and through her personal knowledge to those who are interested and can benefit from it. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. If it was for, I mean, it's not going to be for lack of talk. If we could, we could, we could have hours and hours of reporting because there's so much, there's so much to share, so much knowledge that you have. And so the, the challenge here is going to be what questions to ask. So for people to obtain, for, for a company or a person that says, I want to start my own construction company, for them to get surety bonding, what's required? What is it that you're looking for when someone goes to you, they haven't done had a company? What's, what do you think is needed? Well, first of all, I think that, you know, what might be helpful, Patricia, is for those who have not been involved to sort of understand what the product is that we're really talking about, you know, and it's, uh, you know, from a historical standpoint, I mean, surety ship is defined as a individual standing in for the credit of another person. In other words, you're guaranteeing someone else's performance, you're guaranteeing someone else's credit. There are a number of biblical references to surety ship, so it goes back thousands of years, and basically what it would amount to is that uh, uh, an individual was putting some goods on a ship in England to ship across uh, the Atlantic to the US or to any place else or to India, and there was some concern about that shipment getting there. So they would get uh, or, or, or obtain the guarantee of someone else uh, who had sufficient funds to guarantee that that process would take place. And that's a form of surety ship. Uh, for us here in the United States, it really began back in the 1800s, uh, towards the end of the 1800s. The government was obviously expanding, they were doing a lot of building, and there were issues from time to time about contracts, contractors that they were hiring not 
paying their suppliers, not paying their laborers, not paying their subcontractors. And so the government, and of course, the, you couldn't put a lien on government property, so it left the suppliers, the contractors, the, uh, the subcontractors, and the laborers without any basic recourse other than to sue the government. If they prevailed, then that meant the government had to pay for it twice. They paid uh, the contractor once, and he didn't pay all of his subs, suppliers, and laborers, and now the government has to double dip and do it. They found that unacceptable. So in 1896, they passed what was called the Hurt Act, which was a form of payment bonds required by the contractors. That act left much to be desired, but in 1933, they pay, the, the, the uh, Congress passed what we all know as the Miller Act, which is the basis for all surety ship in the United States. And that, uh, the Miller Act requires that anyone doing a government contract provide a performance and payment bond if the contract is over $200,000. Uh, every state since then has passed what they call the Little Miller Act, which is state requirements that anybody doing public work has to provide a performance and payment bond to guarantee that particularly that the sub suppliers and laborers are paid. And uh, at the same time, a performance bond is required so that if that contractor should default, someone will come in and finish the project so that the government doesn't have multitudes of half finished projects uh, that they have no more money to, uh, to finish. So the idea of having a performance and payment bond comes, you know, like I had said, uh, goes all the way back to biblical times and now is statutory and uh, the, the payment bond is statutory in every state in the union, all 50 states. Now, in order to obtain the bonds, which is, you know, Patricia's question, in order to obtain that guarantee, that guarantee that through the performance bond, that the project will be complete if the contractor fails, and secondly, the payment bond. That guarantee for third parties, subcontractors, material, and suppliers, that they will be paid if the general contractor fails to pay them. You have those two bonds, and my job and the profession that I have is a matter of obtaining what we call surety credit, which is what we're talking about, the ability to get performance and payment bonds for contractors. In order to do so, uh, the best uh, analogy I can give, or the best comparison I can give, is that the underwriting process, or the, the underwriting that a surety company would go through to determine whether a contractor was uh, you know, worthy of that credit, is basically the same that you would do, that a bank would do, to determine whether they were worthy of the line of credit that they were looking for, whether they were financially at a level and organizationally at a level where that could be extended. So it comes down to uh, the surety company, you come to me or my associates or my competitors and you are a contractor and you are interested in doing public work and of course private entities uh, also, many private entities require performance and payment bonds, principally those that have a bank loaning the money for the project. If you have a $50 million apartment house and you have Bank of America loaning the money to the developers for it, Bank of America is going to require a performance and payment bond. Their, their single focused interest is in the payment bond, what we call a lien law bond, 713.23 in the state of Florida, which says that it guarantees that there will not be a lien on that property. So if there are disputes, the subcontractors or, excuse me, material men that are, that are not being paid because of the dispute and put a lien on the project, that lien is actually transferred to the bond so that at the end of the project, Bank of America, no matter how many disputes there are, has a lien-free piece of property that can be, where the financing can be taken over by the, uh, uh, you know, the final uh, lender. So you have a situation where the underwriters, 
that are going to determine whether or not they can provide this product for you are going to look at your balance sheet, your profit and loss sheet. They're going to analyze your financials. You'll be required, in most cases, to get a CPA review or audit at the end of the year. They'll want to look at the personal financial statements of the owners. Uh, they don't have to be CPA prepared, but they'll want to know that there are no difficulties from a personal standpoint that may drag on and create issues for the company that they're bonding. In other words, if the, uh, the owners of the company had other uh, uh, business adventures outside of the construction company and were doing developing and they had a development that wasn't working, the surety underwriter is going to say, well, the assumption is, is they're going to take money out of the construction company to take care of that project. And then that's going to dilute the financial statement we were depending on to complete the project. So they'll look at the corporate statement. They'll look at the personal statements. Then they're going to look at the organization. They're going to do a deep dive into the organization. They're going to ask you what jobs you've done. Give me the five largest jobs you've done. Tell me who the owners of the company are. Make sure that we've got a complete knowledge of all the owners of the company and that we've got financial information on them. Uh, you know, let's uh, do a deep dive into the credit to make sure that there's not, not been any bankruptcies, that there's not been any issues, that we basically have a company that functions at a level where there, were not, where there will not be outside issues that could result in a potential default for issues that we don't know about right now once we give a bond. And then, of course, you know, you have uh, the, the surety company underwriter is going to ask the contractor, do you have a bank line of credit? We want you to have a bank line of credit because, listen, sometimes owners don't pay on time and you need to have a fallback position. So they'll ask you to get a line of credit. So it's a basic underwriting process where they are looking at the finances of the company. They're looking at the finances of the owners. They're looking at the organizational aspects of the company in great detail. And then they're looking for some third party fallback, such as a bank line, et cetera. And if all these things come together, the surety company will say, listen, we, we want to partner with this construction company. We want to provide them credit that we would provide to Lunacon or competitors of Lunacon uh, in the marketplace. Well, thank you for that extensive uh, answer. And uh, as, you're, as you talk, the question comes to mind, when do you think surety companies do enough of, I don't want to call it a good job, but do, you, do they communicate uh, enough with the construction companies or the owners or the, or the, leadership, or, or the leadership on these things, you know, people want to grow, get more work, get more work, but there's things that the bonding company and the, is looking at, the surety company is looking at whether to give them or not to give. Do you think they partner, they communicate often or as much as they could to, to let, the, let the company say, you know what, for you to get to this level, you need to make sure that your structure is this way, or that you, I know you want to grow, so this is what we're looking for. These are the metrics that you need to make sure that you are taking into consideration if you want to get to this level. You think that's communicated enough? That's a very perceptive question, and, and the truth of it is, it, 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 to a great extent, depends on the broker and depends on the, the way that, that the, that the, surety line of credit is handled with that particular contractor because, uh, I, and again, drilling down on your question, what it amounts to is that there is ratio analysis uh, uh, in the surety 101 underwriting process. They're going to look at the balance sheet and they're going to look at the basic ratios, you know, the working capital, the the, the, the equity, you know, the, the, the sales to equity, the amount of working capital you have to the amount of credit you want. As an example, uh, in today's underwriting world, it is not uncommon to, for the sureties to take uh, what we call a 5% working capital or a 20 times working capital approach, which means that 
if you've got a million dollars of uh, uh, of working capital, they would be willing to give you $20 million of surety credit on an aggregate basis. Now, the question, uh, Patricia, that you ask is, all right, that's where you are now, but as a contractor, you want to grow, and you feel that you have the ability to do so, what is it that you need to do as it relates to your relationship with that surety company or your surety broker to make sure that the avenues of growth and you're depending on having the surety credit to grow are open to you. And the, uh, like I said, the question is perceptive because at the end of the day, we talk about, you know, the surety 101 underwriting process and, you know, the things that the surety requires and all the checklists that they have in order to get to the point that they want to deal with you. At the point in time when they decide that you are a company they want to deal with, it actually becomes quite subjective. Uh, it is, surety companies will often move off the reservation from a financial perspective and they want you to be at a 5% working capital, but they'll be willing to dilute that somewhat because of who you are and the communications we've had. So the key to it is for the contractor and the surety company, the underwriters that make the decision to have face-to-face. -face. And that's what we as the broker arrange. And when we sit down and talk to our contractors and, we, and they are saying, and, 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 and we're looking uh, out of the windshield and it, too often it's easy for underwriters and brokers and so forth to sort of underwrite out of the rear view mirror. In other words, this is what you've done, and this is where you've been, but the key to it is to sit down and have that conversation through the windshield and say, all right, where do you want to go? What are the opportunities? And then we have that conversation about what it takes to get there. Because if, uh, if, if the largest job you've ever done is $10 million, and you, th and, and you see this perfect job out there for $40 million, uh, there is a way to get there. Now, in the normal underwriting uh, arena, a surety company typically doesn't want to go more than twice as big as the largest job you've done before because they'd say, do you have the experience to do it? But it's, it's one of those things where, we, and we have these discussions often. All right, you tell us, Patricia, why this job makes sense. And when you start with that question and when you have that face-to-face, -face, then, 99% of the time, something can be worked out because, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, I mean, the old adage is the surety company is the surviving partner in this thing because they're not going to go broke. So you have to take the position that, listen, the contractor is not going to ask for this because this is their life. This is their business. So obviously they see something in this project or this larger program. Maybe the program was set at $100 million and with all the work you see coming up, you're going to have to have capacity to do $150 million. Well, it's the same conversation. Why? Who, do, who have you brought on? I mean, and you could sit down in the conversation and say, well, listen, Chuck, we've, and you tell the underwriter, we just hired this person and this person, here's the resume. They're going to be instrumental in making certain that we can, you know, leap to that next level. But this is, this is something that we do all the time. And that when you, when you realize at the end of the day to be, if I had to, uh, you know, to, 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 to broad brush it, you would say that 30% of the underwriting process, once the initial underwriting has been done, and once you've had that initial underwriting process and you've been accepted as a client, at, from then on, 30% is analytical and 70% is subjective. It's conversation, it's face-to-face, -face. it's, if you've got a plan, you tell us what the plan is. Now, where the process typically does not work that well is where you don't have that conversation first. All of a sudden, you know, things are, uh, you know, working within the limits that you, we have all laid down and we're all very comfortable with that. And all of a sudden you've got either a single job or a program way outside of that. And the contractor is saying, I want to do this. 
And that doesn't mean that we can't get there, but the, it, it, it's, it's like expecting a plane to take off at the end of the runway. It doesn't work. You have to get there at the beginning of the runway, have the conversation, tell the surety why, talk to them, manage the process, and then your broker, you know, uh, that would be in, my, in our case, it'd be me or whomever, will manage the process with the underwriters, will sort of, you know, uh, assist in bringing the conversation from the contractor to the surety underwriter together and seldom when you approach it on that basis do you not obtain what you need to obtain so it, it's it's a process and it differs with every company but you know it's very doable yeah i i agree and so when you're you will do a really good pro as best as you can assessment of the risk at the front end before I'm meeting a company or saying, I'm going to partner with you, I'm going to help you do all help your help your mission. As time evolves and people make decisions, you know, you're not part of the day-to-day -day, um, conversation of the company, you know, there's a regular meetings, you ask, why do you want this job? But you know, our industry, I think uh, Emilio Alvarez, uh, the other day, summarized it really well in, in our, one of our uh, episodes saying that our industry is really, it's really more about managing risk and cash flow. Managing cash flow, managing risk. So, you know, we start, I, in my case, I, I was a project manager for MCM, and then I was head of construction for the city of Colombia. One day I said, my kids, I'm a single mom, I want to start a company, so that I can be closer to them. That was my, my thought. And a lot of people think that they're going to find more freedom by having their own company, you have a dream, etc. And you become good at doing something for someone, a, tech a technical person, but you really not handle the whole, the whole operation of a company. So when you start little by little, you're growing, you're growing, and you know that at some point, as you grow, it's part of business too, you grow, you're successful, and you're growing fast, now you have a lot of bullets coming at you in different ways, shareable forms. What I'm saying is, it's a risk management business. And so how do you get better at managing risk from the perspective of, of a business owner? How, is, it, is, it, is it the client that you select? Is it your processes? Is it your estimate? Is it your operation? The question is, what three things do you need to avoid in order to, or, or when, a, when a company had bad financial outcomes that are preventing you from growing, that are preventing you from obtaining more surety capacity. What do you think happened that shouldn't have happened in your opinion? Well, first of all, uh, the you know the old adage, and it's an old adage because it's, it's like adages that, 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 that sustain themselves. It's true. There is no such thing as a good job for a bad owner. So, you know, if there is anything that a construction company that intends to survive needs to do is to understand the people they're working for. And it's not just in the private side. I mean, there are some horrible public owners out there. And, you know, your decision to deal with them uh, is multi-layered. As an example, you know, we deal with some very large uh, construction entities. And without naming some of the public obligees, there are certain public entities that pay very poorly. Now, if you're a small emerging contractor, you, you know, you can't sustain 90 day, 120 day payments. Now, the larger contractor looks at it differently. They have the capital resource to do it, and they know that there is less competition on some of these jobs because the smaller contractors know that they don't get paid, that they can't do it. So they're saying, we can work for this entity, mark up the profits and make more money, and we're able to sustain the cash flow process. So it's a matter of knowing the owner. And there are owners out there in the private side with a reputation that you just don't. I mean, uh, it, it, it may sound heavy-handed from our standpoint, but if one of my accounts came 
to me on a large uh, condominium. Uh, and this individual that I'm thinking of were the developer. I'd have to say, listen, I'm, I, you may be upset with me, but I'm going to do you possibly the biggest favor anyone has done and tell you I won't bond it simply because I know what the result of that will be. And how do I know? Because I've been involved in it. I've seen it before. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously they didn't know who it was. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, number one is you have to know who you're working for. And there have been, it's changed over the years, but uh, there have been various estimates that have come down from, you know, the surety companies uh, as a, you know, that make these prognostications as a whole, but there have been years when over 70% of the losses they have had have come from owners not paying the contractor. I can't remember of a single loss where at the end of the day, the claims department of the surety company says, you know, too bad, this contractor just didn't know how to build that building. Now, there's no question about it. Certain contractors build more efficiently than others, it's never a matter of technically not being able to do the job. It's a matter of not being able to get paid. Now, that idea of not being able to be paid uh, comes in, it, it, it's very layered. Uh, in some cases, the, the municipality or the owner, they do that as a matter of conserving cash as a process or just because it is their culture and, you know, their... Uh, they're in control of it, and they feel like that at the end of the day, they can get certain benefits by stringing the contract throughout. That's number one. Number two, it may not be that at all. It may be that the, the project is poorly designed. You've got, uh, you've got change orders, uh, and, and change orders are very, very difficult. With some entities on the public side, the change orders that exist through the project can't be negotiated or won't be negotiated until the project is over, until the project is complete. Well, that means that the contractors had to pay for all these change orders all the way, and they may get them, but typically, and a lot of times, at the end of the project, particularly in the private side, the, con the owners do what we call the, the 50 cent dance, which they'll negotiate 50 cents on the dollar for you, and you lose it. And then, you know, if you've got scope changes and so forth, that can be, they can be rather significant. Or when are you going to get paid for them? There are certain public entities that will negotiate uh, change orders at that point in time, agree for payment, and you get paid. So, uh, you know, number one is really knowing the owner. And when we say knowing the owner, I guess as much as anything, knowing whether and how you're going to get paid absolutely imperative you know you know the second you know uh, you know the, the second issue that we have and you know you 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 look at some of the problems that uh you know that exist uh you know uh, you, you know comes down to you know a contractor and it's it's listen uh, you know it's the old starving man at a buffet uh syndrome if the economy, as an example, has slowed and you've been without work, then all of a sudden things start to turn around, there's a lot of work, there is a tendency, and contractors by their very nature, or they wouldn't be in the business they're in, are optimists. So they'll go out and, as I said, it's the starving man at the buffet approach, they will take way too much work. They can't resist the temptation. They, 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 they've been starving for the last year or two, and now all of a sudden they got the work, so they end up taking more work than the organization can sustain. And there's nothing that, that will uh, create financial loss quicker than having unattended projects, projects that you don't have the uh, project executives for, that you do not have the people for, that you don't have the sub-base for. So... Taking too much work uh, is, uh, you know, an issue that has, you know, created a lot of losses. The third thing, and, and you know, again, this is not, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, you can't say, you really can't say in the, you know, the, the discussion that we're having that, you know, 
X amount percentage losses come from people not being paid. X percentage comes from, from people taking too much work too quickly. Organizations not capable of, you know, of covering. And now the third thing, so I'm, I'm not saying that there are, are, are set percentages for it, but the third area is uh, when contractors get into areas that they do not really know. And this is, uh, you know, the, 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 the you know, uh, uh, an extreme example, a, a vertical contractor, a contractor doing apartment houses, doing condos, decides that there's a lot of engineering work out there, a lot of road work, or they decide, let's do this, let's start doing site work, let's start doing other types of work. And underestimating their ability to do it, underestimating the cost it takes to get into it, and underestimating their ability to get the people to do it. So, you know, it really comes down to, you know, knowing who you're working for, uh, having an organization where you have, where you're not stretching the organizational limits, and thirdly, staying in your lane, doing what you know how to do. And if, you know, there is reason in those three areas, uh, you know, typically a contractor uh, will be successful year after year. Is this why you say, I remember you saying that the most profitable projects many times is the one you look at? Uh, we use that adage all the time. Many times the project that you didn't get would be the, mo the most profitable project because there are projects that, you know, uh, that just for whatever reason, listen, when a, when, a, when a project goes bad, it's not that the contractor doesn't know how to do it, but some, there, there, there are architects and engineers that have to lay out the basis for doing that project. And there are, uh, and I hate to say it, they're, they're just, I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of terrible surety brokers, but so I, I, you know, I can't throw egg at anybody else, but there's a lot of terrible, uh, 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 you know, architects and engineers. And you get one of those jobs, and more often it typically happens in the large engineering, the road contractors, the tunnels, the, the bridges, that type of thing. You know, I, listen, a 40-story building is a 40-story building. Doesn't mean they're all the same, but you, 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 you know, staying away from, you know, projects, and the contractor will generally know when he looks at the, 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 the specs of the job and, 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 you know, how it has been formatted. And if he sees problems and he says, well, we'll just deal with that uh, with scope changes and, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, change orders, that's where it goes to hell. And some projects, it uh, doesn't matter who's going to do them, it will just be a losing project because of the associated uh, uh, skills of engineers, architects, and others that uh, uh, that format that project for the contractor. So let's assume a contractor runs into trouble. They got with the wrong owner. There's chain orders that they have been, they have had to do the work, or they have, or their staff has done the work without an approved chain order. And now you have a ton of uh, work performed and not an ability to bail for it because the gender hasn't been approved. And uh, there's uh, there's issues everywhere. There's people issues. All the stuff that you said that you shouldn't do, it's happening. And you are the, the agent of this company. What do you recommend this contractor do in order to not, there is in trouble, what should they do? Should they hide it? Should they um, not communicate with their uh, CPA? Should they not communicate with you? Or should they be uh, open and honest about it? What do you think is the best approach? Because, you know, everyone makes mistakes, and I don't think any of these situations has not happened to any company that has been in business for 20 years. So what is your recommendation? Well, it's one of these situations that, you know, uh, when you, at, at the end of the day, a company that, either goes out of business or gets in a serious problem, runs out of money, that's it. It's that strikeout at the bottom of the ninth. Now the question is, were, are there things that they can do uh, to you know, alleviate the problem? Number one, do they have a bank line? 
Is it, is it a matter of putting more money into the company? Uh, to what extent do the owners want to go? Do they have personal real estate, property? Uh, do they want to get a second on their own home? Uh, what are their personal resources? In other words, it's a matter of saving the company. So their lives depend on them doing it. The first thing they have to do is to look for sources of capital. But even before they do that, and this is where it becomes difficult because you have what we term these black hole projects where, you know, well, uh, it's a $10 million project. It looks like we're going to lose a half a million dollars on it. And they're looking at it at 25% through the project, it's just not going right. Things are not, you know, it's not what we, we bid it poorly or whatever the case is. Then at 50% through the project, well, it looks like we're going to lose a million. At 75% of the project, oh, we're going to lose three million. By the time it's over, you know, it's a four or five million dollar loss. And it's what we call black hole. It just keeps, you know, there is no end to the loss. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's almost a matter of the contractor when he has a project that he knows he's going to lose on. The first thing you have to do is to sit down with your CPA, your, your banker, your people, your, your, your organization, and you have to lay this out. What is, where is the bottom? You know, what do we forecast as the, uh, you know, the, uh, what we call the PML, the probable maximum loss. What is the PML of this project? Once you do that, and you've got a fair amount of certainty on that, Patricia, then you're going to sit down and you're going to say, here are the resources. Now, you can have a terrible job, but you can have 20 other good jobs, okay? So, uh, you know, the first thing you say, well, uh, you know, hate to lose on any job. Uh, we're going to make, you know, on all the other jobs that we've got, I think we're going to make, you know, $5 million. And we're going to lose $4 million on this. Well, terrible to end a year with a million dollar profit uh, when we could have had $5 million profit. But basically, what you're, what you're doing then is, you know, you're not robbing people to pay Paul, but you're using the, you know, the profits for the other projects are sustaining the loss. And that, if that happens, and that happens to contractors all the time, all right, that's not the end of the world. You're not going to go out of business. You figured it out. But the point of it is, and the important point is, that you have assessed it first. You figured it out. You looked at it. Now, like looking at reality as it is, yeah, as but it I'm is. hiding from it. It's that so important to, to know your numbers exactly. and to look at. And, and, and to bring in your professionals, you sit down with your CPA, you sit down with your people, and you know you, you don't necessarily have to sit down with your surety company if there's not going to be a loss. On the, in other words, if you think that you can't finish it, and then the owner is going to have to terminate you, then the sooner you bring in the surety. Typically, though, in these situations, that's probably not the case. It's just going to you're just going to end up with a either a lousier than you want year or a terribly lousy year. Now, if you are at the point in this analyzation process where you, you know, you can't see the end of it and you don't have another profitable work out there, you think to sustain it, that's when you start going to the, you know, to the, uh, you know, do I sell our farm? Do I sell our boat? Do I mortgage our house? you have to then go to the personal assets you've got. And then, you know, uh, and there's no quick answer to this. If you look at all that and you still don't have enough money to finish the project, then you call the bankruptcy. Oh, okay. Not much else you can do. There, 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 is, there is a limit. I mean, at that point in time, you, you know, you would then sit down and try to structure uh, you know, a, a reorganization and see what you could do. But it, throughout this process, you've got to determine, knowing the owner and so forth, is there a point in time you can sit down with the owner and try to work through something? But typically, if the owner's got a bond, he's got no incentive to do it. Because, you know, if you can't finish it, you've got a bonding company that has all the money to finish it. The bonding company will then, at the point of termination, come in take over the project, and there's a number of approaches that they can take, but they'll finish the project and they'll pay all of your vendors. And, you know, at the end of the day, 
the owner will get what the owner asked for, and the owner will get what he paid a bond premium for. So there's, in most cases, little incentive for him to do anything to, I mean, why is he going to uh, throw more money into the project to help you because, you know, it's a bad project, etc. Doesn't have to do that. So, but, you know, the reality is reality, and it happens, and there is a point in time when that call to the bankruptcy attorney has to be made. Okay, so let's turn, it up, turn it around. There's so many opportunities in, a, in, in this environment that we're in. Uh, it is it is challenging. It's an industry that requires. It is easy when it is easy to get into construction. You know, you pass a, a, a license. It's not that difficult. But then staying in it, I think, is what's more challenging, and that's where the transformation is. I think it's at least for me, even spirit, because just sticking with it, you know, and, and developing that resilience. And that uh, commitment to to see something completed and uh, overcoming uh, challenges and issues is it's, it's transformative. I think. But um, in this environment that we live in, we're in Florida. We have so much work everywhere. It's coming. I mean, in the private sector, the public sector, at the local level, federal level. Yet challenges in uh, Supplier, suppliers in the supply chain, challenges with staff, challenges with the environment, you know, we have wars. I love, I always like asking you these questions because you, you always keep a good uh, perspective as to the times we're living and how they affect our industry. So can you elaborate and help share with our listeners? Well, these are, these are interesting times because of course, first of all, you know, going back to your original statement there, it's uh, the construction industry, construction business is a very complicated, multifaceted business. It is not for the faint of heart. Next to restaurants, there are more bankruptcies in the first seven years in the construction business than any other business in the United States. So it's a tough, tough business. So the, you know, ability to continue to move forward uh, successfully depends now in our current environment under a number of uh, addressing a number of issues that we haven't had to in the past. Uh, in my 55 years, I have never seen a time, uh, 55 years in the business, never seen a time when uh, we have been short of supply. Here in the United States, we are not accustomed to having empty shelves at the supermarket. We are not accustomed to ordering construction materials and having them in short supply. We are not accustomed to having price increases uh, of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% on materials in short periods of time. So managing this process is an extremely difficult process and just adds to the tremendous challenges that contractors have. So in today's marketplace, uh, if you are undertaking a contract to build a building, uh, you know, you have to address one way or another the issue with escalating costs uh, in the project. Now, most uh, private owners don't want to give, have an escalation clause in the contract. They want to because of the financing arrangements they have to go through. They want to have some certainty. So a lot of times what we're seeing is contractors uh, entering into cost plus contracts with a GMP, but a but a heavy layer of contingencies between what they look at their cost factors now and what they are concerned that it might be later. So that if those uh, increases do materialize, they have the contingencies. So I mean, and there are different ways to do it. Now in the public sector, it depends. If you're working for the FDOT, they have escalation clauses in FDOT contracts. If you're working for you know, other en uh, public entities, they don't. And they don't work on a cost plus uh, with a GMP. So you really have to look at that right now. I mean, there, there will be more financial loss and more potential bankruptcies in the construction industry over the next three to four years based upon the escalating increase 
in materials and supplies than anything else. Plus, contractors are continuing to face this lack of, 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 of personnel. We just don't have enough people. And, you know, during the 70s, uh, I can remember they had a number of very successful vocational schools in South Florida, but we went into that phase uh, from a, you know, a, uh, you know, I, you know, I guess, a, you know, a, a national view of what success, uh, what, what brings us success. Everyone needed to get a four-year college degree. And it didn't matter whether what the college degree was in, just get a four-year college degree. So we had decades in which vocational training for these individuals that we, for the MEPs, for the, the, the laborers, for the structural people, were not in place. So at this point in time, and the thing that concerns me more than anything else, and should concern every contractor down here, when you're looking at plumbing, electrical, and HVAC, do you realize that the average age of those techs, and some of these techs, I mean, you have to be, uh, you know, you have a long apprenticeship plus to get to the point that you are really uh, at a level Location. that you need to be, that's right, that you need to be to accommodate the projects you need another 10 years. The average age in South Florida is over 55 years of age. So you look at it and you think that we've got problems with laborers and some of the others. How do you, where do we get all of the techs in the MEP uh, area of construction? Because this is where the technical uh, ability is. So we are facing some long-term, very, very difficult issues. We have construction and economy. Uh, last year, the fastest growing city in the nation was Miami, over 30% growth. And, you know, we have tremendous amount of building going down here, and we don't see any, uh, you know, there is, you know, it's not going to level out. It's all about the demographics. If you look at the situation, and the demographers have basically said that Florida will grow in raw population in the next 20 years faster than any state in the union. And we're not going to catch California and Texas, but we're going to close the gap. California has 38 million people. Texas has 27. We have 22 to 23 million people. The, those that are, the demographers that are looking at this are saying, where, and, and their job is to say, these are the population trends. This is where people's going to go. There are a couple of studies, and one of them uh, said that uh, at least 15% of the baby boomers will end up in Florida in the next 20 years. The other said 30% of the baby boomers will end up in Florida in the next 30 years. Well, let's do the math. There's 74.6 million baby boomers. That's 1945 to 1965. That's where the trillions of dollars of, of pension funds, 401ks, and and wealth is. That's where the wealth is. If 30% of the baby boomers in the next 20 years move to Florida, do the math. 30% of 74.6 million people is 20-some million. That doubles our population. It is impossible for us to build enough infrastructure to accommodate that many people. So our issues are multifaceted. If you're, in the, if you're a contractor, uh, you have your work cut out for you because number one, you're gonna, there is not going to be a lack of opportunity to get the, to get work, but you know, you've got issues with the supply chain. You will have increasing issues finding the people to do the work. And as a general contractor, which Patricia is, your subcontractors are the ones that have to man the jobs. And if they can't, if the electrical contractors can't find electrical, uh, new electricians when their 55-year-old uh, electrical uh, associates are retiring, or with the HVAC or with the plumbing, what do you do? So we have uh, a number of issues to overcome. It sounds good when you say that we will grow faster and we will probably be the single, Florida will be the single best construction market in the entire United States. That all sounds good, but at the same time, as a contractor in this marketplace, you have to have the ability to facilitate the challenges that will come to you 
when you look at, uh, you know, the, the, some very difficult problems that are in place now and that are just over the horizon. And what do you do? I mean, uh, it's a, it's a, the opportunities are there and to get young people into our industry, it's easier said than done. Very much so. It's easier said than done to get people, even though it can provide a good living, a very good living for you. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. So changing a little bit more on topic, um, I don't want to stop our, our conversation without, but first of all, thank you so much. I really admire you a lot and your level of knowledge and how good, how you have prioritized your health. I, I say that because our industry is not an industry where people in it really prioritize health. On the contrary, we go out it every day, we go out there to solve challenges, not necessarily in the best working environment, the best culture, because there's so much involved, so many involved, and people don't take enough good care of them. Moreover, the our industry is the second highest rate of suicide. So that has to do a lot of you know, the mental side of it, how you take care of yourself. And I am gonna ask you how old are you? I know how old are you, but if you want to share, what have you done to keep yourself the way not only your body but your mind? Well, it, it, again, you know, I'm 79 this year, so I'm no no spring chicken, but you know, uh, first of all, it starts off with, you know, some good genes. And uh, that's not the answer to it. But, you know, there are people who have, even at young age, difficult uh, physical issues that they have to face. And uh, some of them are genetic. Uh, you know, there are folks who I've got friends whose mother and father died in their mid-50s of heart failure. And they have heart issues right now and they're in their you know uh, early 60s and they have to deal with things that I didn't because I didn't have any of those genetic issues on the other hand uh, you know and there are uh, and and it, it's interesting that and, and, and there's a genetic component to this there are people who like to exercise and like to not just exercise but like physical activity and there are folks that do not. Uh, uh, and again, I have, we've got a very large family, and I see it in the kids. All the kids are not the same that way. Some of them really enjoy it. And if you enjoy it, you do it. I enjoy it. Uh, you know, we have a very, you know, uh, uh, nice home in South Florida. We raised seven kids, and we had a large home. And instead of selling it when, you know, had an empty nest for the last 25, 30 years, but, you know, we remodeled and made it ours. So I have, to answer, uh, you know, Patricia's question, I have, uh, through the remodeling process, I have a gym uh, that, in the house, that practically rivals LA Fitness in the amount of equipment that I have. So I enjoy it. I use it. I think it's extremely important. I probably overdo it to a certain extent, but if I want to get really personal, uh, I exercise very briskly, very hard, three hours every day, seven days a week, from six to nine. That's my time, my gym. I don't allow anybody. I don't work with anybody else, but it's right there in my home. And uh, there is not much that, if anything, LA Fitness has that I don't have. So it's extremely well equipped, and I enjoy doing it. I enjoy the processes. I supplement, whether I do it wisely, I probably overdo it. But again, it's all part of the process. So I have been extremely fortunate from a physical standpoint. I, uh, frankly, at my age, I've never had a physical and never taken a prescription. Uh, never had an issue. Uh, can't remember the last time I was sick. Uh, uh, never get tired. So whatever it is, you know, I'm very grateful. Now I say that and, you know, I'll probably kill over tomorrow from a heart attack because I was so boastful about this. But anyway, it's something that, you know, is important. And when you, particularly as you age, nothing, uh, I mean, it is impossible to be happy when you are terminally ill or when you are very ill. So at the point in time when, 
you know, you have issues, whether it's cancer, whether it's heart disease, whether it's, you know, any number of any other, uh, you know, I have a good friend that has kidney issues and, uh, you know, you can just go down the list. Uh, their lives end up centering around those physical issues they have. So if you can avoid them, you know, it's good to do it. And uh, I think putting the effort into uh, to doing that is absolutely, you know, uh, at the top of everybody's list because, uh, and particularly when you get to my age, uh, you know, you the first thing that it seems like that I talk about with my friends who are my age is, you know, how you feeling, you know, <laughs> and if they've got some physical condition, you always, you know, you always have that conversation to begin with. So maintaining your health is at the top of everybody's. So I, I believe it's all about rituals and you know, if we, some people call it discipline, but the ritual, the little things that you do every day for you. Now you're exercising 30 hours a day. I don't know if that yeah. was three hours. I don't know if that was the case all your life. Uh, I know. I have most, I have the, the three hours wouldn't, didn't work when we were raising our kids. I mean, I, I always had access to facilities and, and, and frankly, through most of my life I've exercised. But you know, when you got kids in school, you know, I can't, I couldn't do what I'm doing now. So I did, I did, it, yes. I've been, I, I've been, I've been very disciplined. It's, yes. part of, it's, it's been part of your success, I, I guess, on a professional level because your body carries, carries you. Yeah. And also your diet, right? You only eat at this stage, you've been eating mostly uh, like a, so yeah, yeah. some, some of, is it like a keto? Yeah, well, it's very much like, <laughs> again, I, I, I do, I, I do an extensive amount of reading on it I, because, because I enjoy it, okay? And there is so much out there you can do. So. I've gone through the phases that a lot of people have. Uh, you know, I went through years ago, uh, of course, in the 80s, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, I got on the uh, Atkins and I felt really good in the Atkins diet and it worked very well. But then, you know, society and, you know, we went into a phase nationally where we went into the low fat, and you know the cholesterol issues, and I don't believe the cholesterol story at all. So that's another subject. But anyway, so you started on the no fat, and I would be lying if I didn't say that I got swooped up in some of these as time went on, because most of the literature that was written centered around that, and it was justifying. I went through at one point in time a vegetarian phase. I'm so happy that I'm not there anymore. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, you do that. But at the end of the day. It comes down to now, and you know, if we have the, if I have the privilege of sitting with you five years from now, maybe we'll have a different discussion, but I don't think so. It really comes down to the, you know, when our digestive, over the four million years that our digestive systems have evolved, what have they evolved to digest and how does it work? Well, first thing that you understand is, is that you know, if you want to go back, and this is probably beyond the discussion you want, to the 100, 100 gathering stage, you know, you ate what you killed, and every day you did not eat. In other words, our digestive systems and uh, this three meal a day regime that we have is what kills us. Even if you eat pretty well, why do you need three meals a day? You should be hungry most of the time, okay? Uh, no, even is not fasting. You yes, fasting and is, is 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 excellent, and I and I practice it, and I not as often as I probably should, but the the you know I it is something that you should do, but we stuff ourselves with too much food first of all. So uh, you know I try to restrict as much as possible the amount I eat, and 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 you should be hungry most of the time. And then what would I eat if, uh, you know, I were eating according to where our systems evolved? Mainly meat. You know, some, some veggies. Huh? Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I try to stay away from uh, all, all sugars and, and, and starches. I am not, you know, carbohydrates. They were, it becomes sugar. Yeah, it does. And, and, you know, of course, the lower glycemic 
carbs are better than the higher glycemic. So I'll stay completely away from the higher glycemic. If I have it, it's the lower glycemic. And, you know, uh, from that standpoint, and, and, and I, you know, now listen, uh, I could keel over tomorrow. I, I get that. I'm not being, you know, I don't want to be boastful, boastful or pretentious about it, but, you know, I always feel good. So whatever I'm doing, I continue to do simply because it appears to work, okay? Who knows tomorrow? Thank you so much. I have a humble question that I can ask you, but I I think we have a, we have to stop somehow, which ain't leaves up for the future. But I'm very grateful for for your share. I'm very grateful for the level of passion that you have and this desire to continue to help people, even though you don't have to work one more day in your life. You don't have to. But you choose to do it every day because you love it. You love the relationships. I do. I do that, yes. So that in itself is a huge example of why it's so important to live a life that is mission driven and it's uh it's got a purpose behind it. I appreciate it and I do appreciate the opportunity to meet with you and I think that what you're doing here is wonderful and I you know I wish you continued success. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Thriving in Construction, the podcast with Patricia Vanilla. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like to help support the podcast, please share it with others and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. If you have any suggestions or any related topics you would like us to tackle in our future episodes, feel free to comment down below. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week here in Thriving in Construction, the podcast.